be a scientist is to be naive. We are so focused on our search for truth that we fail to consider how few actually want us to find it. It's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. July 3rd, 1987. We drove out of the plant and took the quickest road out of Pripyat to dawn. Yuri drove while I sat in the passenger seat, keeping an eye out for any trouble. We encountered nothing, and the silence was almost worse. In spite of myself, I got more and more nervous. We were about halfway through Pripyat when a sharp hissing caused me to almost fall out of my seat. Yuri swerved on the road almost crashing through a storefront before turning back onto it. I looked around wildly before realizing it was the radio. I laughed mirthfully, and Yuri joined in. My laughter abruptly died in my throat. I put my ear to the radio and thought I could hear faint words coming from it. I fiddled with the radio, and a man's voice, ragged and desperate, filled the BTR. We'll try again in 24 hours. Our location is. The voice was drowned out in a sudden burst of static. I turned to Yuri, my eyes wide. Someone else is out there. Other survivors, I said excitedly. Yuri nodded. We'll keep an ear out for them. We can't leave our comrades behind. I got up and walked to the back of the BTR. Anton was doped up on painkiller. We didn't have many, but it was as good a time as any to use them. The Roman was sprawled out on the seat, half asleep. I nudged him away. We heard people on the radio, other survivors, I said. Roman's eyes lit up, and he bolted upright. I love meeting you people, said Anton dreamily, staring at the ceiling. Roman and I were in deep discussion when a yell from Yuri up front got my attention. We both rushed to the driver's seat. What is it? I asked urgently. Roman's jaw dropped. Holy shit. It's Mikhail. It was. Roman and I grabbed our guns and climbed out of the BTR. He was huddled in an abandoned car, curled up into a ball and muttering to himself incoherently. His suit was stained and tattered, though he still had his gas mask. His backpack was gone and he was missing everything except for his combat knife, which he clutched tightly in his hand. We stood for a moment, staring at him with uncertainty. Oh, I think he's gone off the deep end, said Roman quietly. I nodded. I would be too if I'd been in this hellscape alone for so long. Mikhail finally noticed us. He looked up and stared at me before he whimpered and crawled to the back of the car. It took a while, but we eventually managed to coax him out with a candy bar. We took him back to the BTR I made sure to have my pistol out, just in case. Once we got moving again, we tried talking to him, hoping that maybe he wasn't too far gone. Once I took his knife and gave him some rations, he calmed down a little. In closer inspection, the lack of protection from the radiation had taken its toll on him. His hair was falling out, and there were red stains on his suit where he'd coughed up blood. He was lucky to be alive. He must have gotten one last decent-sized dose of radiation soon before we picked him up, since some of the blood in his suit was fresh. We never got a chance to talk to him or try to bring him back to sanity. An hour or so later, Roman and I were up front with Yuri, debating whether to head for the camp or hunker down for the night, when Anton's voice floated from the back of the BTR. He'd been given more morphine, but this time his dreamy, carefree tone of voice was tinged with fear. Mika, are you okay? No, no, stay away from me, he said. Get back, he screamed, followed by rapid gunfire. We grabbed our rifles and raced to the back of the vehicle to find Anton, his face pale, a pistol in his shaking hand. Mikhail lay face down in a pool of his own blood. Nobody spoke for a second. My stomach dropped and I fell for my pistol on my belt, but the holster was empty. Why did you take my gun? I asked, torn between confusion and a growing sense of anger. Why the hell did 
she kill him? I asked, my voice rising. Yuri knelt over the body and felt for a pulse. I stormed over and wrenched the gun out of his hand. Bullet casings were scattered around Anton. I checked the pistol. The clip was empty and the barrels were still warm. I was filled with rage. I don't know what I would have done to him if it wasn't for Romain. He pulled me away, muttering something in my ear. What it was, I don't recall. I stared at the ceiling, away from Anton and Mikhail, trying to calm myself down. Before I could think of anything to say, something grabbed me and I was picked up and thrown into the wall with incredible force. I slid to the floor, dazed, trying to grab my rifle, only to find it wasn't hanging on my shoulder anymore. My vision was blurry, and I watched as the dark outline of something threw itself at one of my colleagues, whether Roman or Yuri, I couldn't tell. I tried to get up, but felt a searing pain in my wrist as I tried to push myself up. My ears were ringing, but I still heard muffled yelling and machine gun fire. Bullets ricocheted off the inside of the steel compartment, and I felt white hot pain as one buried itself in my shoulder. And I heard other things, sounds no human should make, guttural wailing that tripped every survival instinct in my body, and battered though I was, tried to crawl away from the noise. I didn't get far before something else slammed into me. It hung limply over me, and I tried and failed to push it off. The sounds around me faded, and I closed my eyes. When I opened them again, my head was pounding, and I was covered in bruises. And the lights were out, with the only light source being the now-open top hatch above me. The visor of my gas mask was smeared with blood. I looked up to see Yuri lying on top of me. He had deep cuts covering his body, and his neck was twisted at an unnatural angle. But after several tries, I managed to push Yuri off of me and get to my feet. My suit was absolutely covered in his blood. Everything hurt. My head was swimming, and it was still hard to stand up. With difficulty, I pulled myself together and surveyed the compartment. Blood, bullet casings, and the contents of Yuri's and I's packs were spread all over the floor. A nasty-looking creature with seven spider-like legs, an emaciated torso, and a grotesque, misshapen head lay near the top hatch, surrounded by shredded, bloody clothing. Roman, Anton, and Mikhail were nowhere to be seen. As quietly as I could manage, I found my rifle, walked over to the body, and gingerly nudged it with my boot. No response. I put a few rounds into it, just to be sure. I didn't bother cleaning out the mess. I tried everything, but the BTR wouldn't start. It took a long time for me to figure out what was wrong. It was out of gas. By this time, it was late in the afternoon. I marked the way to the old campsite with one of the maps we'd have been issued with, then buttoned up the hatches. It's dark now, and with the ruckus that we made earlier, there are things outside trying to get in. For the most part, though, all I hear is movement outside, scratching or banging on the hatches. Well, sometimes, though, I swear I can hear whispers. They're faint, but I can hear them. I can't tell what they're saying, and... To be honest, I'd rather not know. Tomorrow I'll make my way to the camp, see if there are any survivors, or at least a vehicle I can use. Oh, I just heard the whispers again. Come out, they say. It's not so bad. I need to get some sleep. I'm imagining things. I have to be. I don't think I can live with the alternative. July 4th, 1987. I made a new friend today. His name's Vasya. Well, it is now, anyhow, seeing as whoever named him before me is most likely dead, and, or, well, an unholy abomination now. So their opinion doesn't count for much. Vasya is a husky, and probably one of the last non-mutated animals in Pripyat. I guess he had enough sense to stay on the outskirts of the city. 
I set out this morning for the camp, and almost every few blocks I had to deal with some new shambling horror. After a few hours of walking, I stopped and listened. Loud barks and whining could be heard from an alley off to my left. I briefly considered moving on, but decided to investigate. As I turned into the alley, I saw a wolf, its back to me, advancing on a mangy dog cowering against the wall behind it. It was clearly starving, and it had a deep cut that began at its snout and stopped at its tail. It appeared fresh, and the glistening red wound seemed to run right on top of its spine. The dog kept its head down and alternated between whimpers and aggressive barks. Neither did anything to deter the wolf as it continued towards its prey. It was odd to see two normal, somewhat healthy animals in the city after everything that had happened, I thought to myself. As if on cue, the moment the thought entered my head, the wolf's head and shoulders split vertically to reveal a huge mouth and huge spiky teeth lining the insides. A thin, very long tongue emerged, lashing about like a whip. Before I even thought about what I was doing, I flipped the safety off of my AK-47 and emptied a full clip into the beast's back. It staggered forward oozing blood tinged with a sickly green. I fumbled for another clip on my belt as it stumbled towards me, snarling. Just as I slid a fresh clip in and chambered around, the dog rushed up to the thing and sank its teeth into its flank. I held my fire as they wrestled with each other. Eventually, I got a clear shot and sent a burst straight down its throat. The wolf howled in agony, snapped its horrid maw shut, and ran unevenly past me down the street. I plucked a grenade off of my belt and tossed it just behind it. I threw myself into the cover of the alley and felt the explosion rattle my teeth and shake the ground ever so slightly. I picked myself up and peered around the corner. In the worst place, there was a pulpy mess of red and metal fragments splattered across the street. I turned and focused my attention on the dog. It sat there, staring up at me. I reached out a hand, but it growled and edged away. Okay, boy, I get it. I'll stay away, I said, edging out onto the street. I walked for another two blocks, and then stopped again. I turned to see the dog following me, keeping a good distance away. It stopped and sat, and when I tried to get close, it bared its teeth and ground at me. I backed off and kept walking. This process repeated itself for most of the afternoon, but as the hours passed, he trotted closer and closer behind me, until, as the sun started to set, he was walking by my side. I settled down for the night in an apartment building on the highest floor. I barricaded the door into the room I'd selected and pushed a bookshelf in front of the only window, just in case something tried to climb in. After offering the dog some meat from my rations, and talking softly to it for a while, he let me pet him. Oh, I'm happy to have the company, even if he tried to lick my face, only to smear drool all over my gas mask visor. Hmm, I'll call you Vasya, I thought out loud. That's my brother's name, I added, turning to face Vasya. It's a nice name, I think. Don't you think so? Vashia barked agreeably. Oh, tomorrow's looking up. If I could only forget about yesterday. Or the day before that. Or the day before that. <sighs> July 5th, 1987. I found the camp today. It was late in the morning when I saw it from the apartment complex where I'd stopped to rest. It was only a few blocks away. I checked it out through my scope. It wasn't as bad as I expected. Despite the damage, there were clear signs of life. There were scorch marks on the pavement where bodies had been burned, and it looked as if the survivors had moved into the surrounding buildings. Barricades made from wrecked trucks, sandbags and crates surrounded the perimeter. I was well rested, too. After my encounter with the wolf, I hadn't encountered a single living thing, well, aside from Vasya. On my way to the camp, the good luck continued. I didn't run into any trouble. 
When I got there, I crept into the camp, rifle in hand. I wasn't going to take any chances. Turns out, neither were they. As I opened the door to the closest building, I saw a group of men huddled around a card table with a map spread out on it, arguing in hushed tones and glancing down at the map every so often. I stood in the doorway for a moment, unsure of what to say or do. Then Vasya trotted in and started running circles around the group, barking excitedly. The group turned in surprise, some of them fumbling for their sidearms. The man bent down to examine the dog before turning to me. His eyes widened. Nikolai, he yelped. Roman, you're alive, I exclaimed. But something wasn't right. Instead of looking relieved, Roman looked suspicious instead. How can I be sure it's really you? he asked. I was confused. I wanted to argue, but something heavy slammed into the back of my head, and everything went black. I woke up in a bedroom with no windows and a heavy oak door that was locked. There was a bookshelf packed with novels, all state approved, of course. So there's at least something to keep me occupied. The only other furniture in the room is an ornately carved wooden table with three chairs and a bed. There's a guard outside, I think. I hear footsteps outside every so often. I'm not sure why they're so suspicious of me. They took away everything but my journal, some pencils, and my sleeping bag. I don't know where Vasya is, but I hope he's safe. Well, I'll get some rest. Perhaps this mess will make sense in the morning. July 8th, 1987. For the past few days, not much has happened. They took blood samples from me, for what I really don't know. Then they had a medic examine me while an armed guard stood in the corner. I'm still not sure why they're holding me here. My patience is waning, but for now I'm somewhat content. I have steady, if meagre, rations given to me, and a safe place to sleep. Vasya is in the room next to me. They didn't tell me when I asked, but I heard him barking and scratching at the wall earlier, so he's safe for now. If they decide he's too much trouble, I have no doubt they'll get rid of him. Roman came in in the afternoon to talk. It was more of an interrogation, to be precise. We sat on opposite ends of the table, him with his back to the door. I told him everything that happened after we separated, and he scribbled notes on a clipboard as I talked. When I finished, he stood up and made to leave. Wait! I said, rising up out of my chair. Aren't you going to tell me how you got here? He regarded me with suspicion. I'm sorry, but I have work to do. Maybe tomorrow. We'll see. He replied, turning towards the door again. I lost my composure and slammed my fist on the table. Well, will you at least tell me how long you're going to keep me locked up in this room? Or why? I yelled shoving the table away from me and stomping towards him. I stopped just inches from his face. You left me to frickin' die out there, I hissed. I... I thought you were dead. We were exposed out in the open, with the BTR dead. I couldn't get back to the camp with much time to spare. Look, if it makes you feel any better, I tried, but... Anton was the only one who was conscious. He's downstairs. He replied, emotion entering his voice for the first time. Do you have him locked up too, or am I just special? I snarled, my anger flaring up once more. No, he's not. I only had time to drag him into one of the buildings and set up camp before night. They're more active then. I thought, if you weren't dead before, well, you would be then, he said. Good luck. If I'd known you weren't. He trailed off. I could see the guilt in his expression. But I had no sympathy. How about Mikhail? I asked. No answer. I said, what about? I stopped at the feeling of something being jammed into my chest. I looked down to see Roman's pistol. Back off, 
he said coolly. Staring daggers at him, I retreated to the centre of the room. If it helps, you might be out of here tomorrow. I really hope you will be. We can talk more then, he said, looking at me with guilt, wariness, pity. Go to hell, I retorted, turning my back to him. I heard a sigh, then the door being closed and the bolt sliding back into place over the door. Reliving this in my head while writing it down is getting me angry all over again. I better sit and read for a bit to calm down. July 9th, 1987 A lot happened, or rather, I learned a lot today. It's all a little hard to process. Early this morning I was shaken awake by Roman. You're good to go. Come downstairs, I'll explain everything, he said. Oh, happy fucking day, I muttered, sitting up and following him out of the room. I swear, you're sounding more and more like Anton every day, Roman chuckled as we descended the stairs. My things were on a chair, and some notebooks and rations were on the folding table I'd seen earlier. Have a seat, offered Roman, grabbing a ration pack and sitting himself next to me. We ate in silence for a bit before he finally spoke up. We thought you might have been dangerous, he said quietly, not meeting my eyes. Like Mikhail. Wait, what? Anton killed Mikhail. <laughs> if anyone's dangerous, it's him, I laughed. Roman slowly shook his head. Anton didn't kill Mikhail. I wish he had. It took four clips of ammo to bring him down, but not before he got Yuri. And you, he added. I leaned back in my seat, my head spinning. How? I asked. And where did you bury him? Roman frowned. What do you... He stopped. Oh, he said. No, you don't understand. That spider thing in the BTR? That was Mikhail. He, um, shed his skin almost, and knocked you out before we could even react. Christ, it all happened so fast. He sighed. We really don't understand how it works. Our best guess is, at the moment, it's radiation exposure, and possibly transmission of fluids. Obviously, we're not going to test that theory. But from what I can tell, Mikhail was just exposed to less radiation over a long period of time than the ones at the plant. It made the process a kind of slow burn, I guess, until... He shrugged. Until we found him at exactly the wrong time. I finished for him. He chuckled wryly. <laughs> Pretty much. We talked for a long time after that. He told me about how he'd barely made it to the camp, being attacked almost every step of the way. When he finished, I nodded. It wasn't easy for me either, but the attack stopped once I got a couple of blocks away. You guys did a good job of clearing out the area. Roman frowned. We didn't. Going even a block from the camp alone is just asking to get jumped by something. Well, guess I got lucky then, I said, grinning. Well, I think it might have been more than that, replied Roman, standing up. Follow me. I need to show you something. We walked into a hallway that led deeper into the building. After a few twists and turns, we arrived at a staircase leading down into what must have been the basement. As we made our way down the stairs, Roman started talking again. We have 17 people here. Our group has three non-coms, including you, and two medics. The ward medic, Ninel. He used to be a surgeon before he joined up. He's the one who checked you out earlier. We've got no officers left, and the non-coms don't really have authority here. Everyone pretty much has an equal say in what our next move is. And what is our next move? I inquired as we reached the bottom of the stairs. I entered a room with tables covered in folders, pieces of papers with notes scribbled on them, and various lab equipment like test tubes and beakers. Getting the hell out of here, 
Problem is, we're almost out of gas. And without vehicles, a group that large is bound to attract trouble. We're trying to reach out to the troops outside the city, but no luck so far with that. In the corner was the medic I'd seen earlier, bent over a table with a dead body on it. We walked over, and I suddenly felt sick. On the table next to it was another body, this one bearing a humanoid figure. It was another of those monstrous creatures. Ninel has been studying the creatures we've encountered, and their connection to normal humans. Hopefully we can find a weakness, or perhaps a way to reverse the process of becoming one of them. But so far, not much progress has been made, Roman explained. I looked closer. Both bodies had their chests cut open and their organs exposed. Ninel looked up from what he was doing. You remember Nikolai, right, Ninel? asked Roman. Ninel nodded. I do. Come over here and I'll show you why we needed that blood sample from you. He motioned us over to a table with more test tubes. He gestured to one tube with a small amount of blood in it. This is yours, he said. He pointed to the one next to it, this one having blood that was slightly different. It had a very faint discoloration, a yellow-greenish tinge that I knew all too well. This one's from the thing on the table, I asked. Ninel nodded. It is. From the tests I ran, I found that this blood is a good deal more radioactive. I took a step back. Ninel added. It's not enough to be really dangerous. As long as you don't swallow it, you'll be fine. Now, Roman says you didn't encounter any other trouble after you found that dog, correct? I nodded. He continued. We did the same tests with the dog. It appears, I'm afraid that the dog has most likely been turned. In rare cases we've seen creatures that still resemble their original forms, at least until they attack. I spotted. But, but when I found him, he was getting attacked by one of those things, and he had plenty of chances to kill me, so why didn't he? Ninel nodded thoughtfully, saying, Well, from what we've seen, these things can be very territorial. The second one, though, that I can't answer. We think that you entered the dog's territory, so to speak. That's why you didn't run into anything once you met him, added Roman. Ninel rummaged through some notes on a table, pulling out a sheet and scanning it before turning back to us. The body is the first to go. It mutates and deforms quickly after a large enough dose of radiation. Something in that process, I'm not sure what, alters their bodies so they can survive extreme radiation exposure. After that, once a dose that would normally be lethal is reached, their mind is altered and twisted until they become killing machines in mind as well as body. Roman spoke up in a worried voice. I never did ask. Do altered humans keep their intelligence? Ninel shuddered. I hope not. If they do, then... He was cut off by an explosion somewhere outside. Muffled yells and machine gun fire came from upstairs. Roman swore. Oh, something's breached the perimeter. Let's move. Ninel ran over to a radio set while Roman and I rushed upstairs. Here, yelled Roman, tossing me an AK-47 from a rack near the door. Ammo is in the crates in the corner. Pick a window and start shooting. A howling mob of mutated beasts made their way towards the building. Men with HMGs and sniper rifles opened fire from the other floors, mowing them down. It was only then that I noticed some of them wore tattered uniforms, others hazmat suits slashed to ribbons, evidence of the past failed expeditions into this radioactive hell on earth. One of them, a woman with an axe lodged in her stomach and freakishly long arms and legs, climbed on top of a burned-out truck and launched herself up at the building. From the floor above, they heard glass shatter, and then screaming. It cut off suddenly. Panic shouts and sounds of a struggle. I watched, startled, as a man was thrown from one of the windows above. He landed at an awkward angle, and even from where I was, I heard his legs snap. He desperately tried to crawl back to safety. We desperately tried to keep the hordes off him. We got to him anyway, and began tearing him apart. 
Someone put a bullet in his brain to stop the screaming. For an hour, we held them off. There were just so many. Eventually, we retreated to the second floor during a lull in the fighting, taking what supplies we could with us. Now the stairs are blocked off, but they'll find us before long. Ninel, Roman, and Anton all made it. Ninel is still trying to contact the outside world for help. Still, I doubt he'll get any response. Not in time, anyhow. Our numbers have been cut down to twelve, and four of those are wounded. We're screwed, and we all know it. Nothing to do but keep fighting, I guess. My shift on guard duty is up. If I'm lucky, I'll still be alive to make an entry in the morning. July 10th, 1987. Well, I'm still here. How much longer, I don't know. At this point, I don't really care anymore. They broke into the second floor just after midnight. We'd already moved the wounded and most of our gear to the roof, so we didn't have to worry about that. As we made a fighting retreat to the next floor, I passed by the room where Vasya had been kept. The door was open. I didn't think about it until I saw Vasya running towards me as I went up the steps. At first, I was glad to see him. Then his skin started to split open at the wound along his back. I watched, frozen, as eight spider-like legs emerged, pulling the skin away as they did. He peeled away the skin on his face, exposing the skull. I snapped out of it and raced up the stairs and into a hallway where the others were waiting. The thing I'd called Vasya followed. Everyone opened fire as he attacked, impaling one soldier on the wall with one of his legs. He pulled it back, and the man fell down, gushing blood. He ran erratically among us before jumping up and tearing out the throat of the man next to me. All the while, the bullets only seemed to make him, it, even angrier. Two more men died before a grenade finished it off. I caught up with Roman as we retreated even further. Looks like you were right, I said glumly. That was the dog? Jesus Christ! Roman replied. Hey, you didn't know. It's not your fault. I nodded, not really believing it myself. At dawn, after we'd been pushed back to the seventh floor, the roof was just above us. There was no more retreating. I was considering whether or not to shoot myself and get it over with, when Roman ran over to me, grinning. Do you hear that? he asked. I paused while reloading and heard only the howls of the monsters coming out and the shots from them trying to stave them off. Yeah, that's the things that are going to eat us alive. Not much to smile about, I replied. Not that, he said. Listen. Then I heard the steady whirring, faint but getting louder. I gasped. No, no way. Oh, hell yes way. Roman said, still grinning crazily. Oh, it's a chopper. We're getting out of here. I whooped. We're not going to die. By the time the helicopter touched down on the roof, though, I wasn't so sure. We had to get out onto the roof, and they were coming at us faster than we could shoot. Their corpses formed a mound next to the stairs to the roof, and their living comrades spewed out onto it, crawling over their comrades' bodies to reach us. Behind us... The wounded, including Anton, and a few crates with Ninel's research were loaded onto the helicopter. Some of the men swept the rooftop with heavy machine guns mounted on the sides. And finally, the few remaining survivors, myself included, could get on board. As we took off, a few creatures managed to latch on to the bottom. One of the men was sliding the side door shut when a thing with four arms and a worn officer's uniform crawled up and tried to force its way in. It latched itself onto the guy, ripping off his gas mask and clawing at his face with two hands, while the other two pulled it inside the copter. Get it off! Get it off of me! He wailed as it tore into him. I charged into them, sending the pair tumbling out of the copter. I hurried to close the door, but not in time to miss the sickening crunch as their bodies hit the ground. It was quiet for a long time until at last the pilot broke the silence. 
almost out of the quarantine zone. It's a good thing you got picked up. The checkpoints on the ground are in lockdown. As for our actual landing, ETA, 15 minutes. Everyone cheered half-heartedly. Well, a lot of time had passed since I'd been resupplied. There was enough vodka in my pack to help me forget for a little while. I'd forgotten it was there, and I was glad for it. I passed out just as we started to land, and I woke up in quarantine. They left our things with us, although they're going to have to decontaminate it once we're out of here. I couldn't care less. I'd like to sleep. Sleep for a long, long time. Anything to stop me remembering what happened in the ruins of Chernobyl. So a fantastic story there. Um, I really did want to get all that done in one video, but, you know, sometimes life just gets in the way. So I hope you don't mind me doing that across two different vids uh, on Monday and Wednesday. But um, I think it was worth it, and you'll be glad to know that there is more on the way. That is in itself one solely contained story, but other parts are coming that take this story into different directions. So I hope you're going to stick with uh, this story in the future. Well, that is enough for me for one night. But another story is coming for you on Friday. And of course, over on my second channel, lots of shorter stories every, um, well... Seems like every Tuesday, uh, Thursday and Saturday, filling in the gaps, <laughs> so to speak. But that is enough for me for one night. So until next time, very, very sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay?